talking about eyes, and we'll probably spend more than one session, I imagine, on it. So let's do that. So with the eyes, now keep in, man, keep in mind that the eyes are the most difficult part of the head for almost all of us, and the head's the most difficult part of the body for almost all of us, and the body, the human form, is the most difficult thing in nature and probably in the world to draw. So we've got quite a challenge. So anytime I'm working on anything, when in doubt, when I'm struggling, frustrated, when I'm learning on a learning curve, even excited about it, but don't know as much as I know I need to know, when in doubt, simplify. So we're going to look at the eye. Whoop, didn't mean to do that. We're going to look at the eyes. Uh, in a simple way, this lesson probably is as far as we get, and then we'll get into more sussing it out. Now, when we look at eyes, and this is, I kind of gave it away here a little bit with all these lovely um, pieces, and I grabbed just Sargent because a lot of us know Sargent pretty well, and he's so good with structure and with simple uh, designs, even when it's quite painterly like this piece is. And it'll give us some nice, easy lessons to, to pull out of this. So we're going to try and make it as simple as possible. And then we'll build on that simplicity and add more nuance, add more complexity, add more style, personal voice, all those kind of things. But we're going to get into the structure of the eye, but we're going to ease into that even quite slowly. So we're really kind of thinking about stair steps of form. Some of those steps will come out. Some will go back in from wherever we're viewing, and that's going to be the nature of the eye. Forehead, upper lid, pupil and iris, cornea on it, and then back out again uh, over the uh, steps of the lower lid and then the cheek and such. So that's what we're working with. So let's see how that comes out for us. So when I'm trying to do the eye, the simplest way to go, but it's probably not going to be the most successful, but we can get pretty decent results with it and sometimes some flat out terrific results from it. So let's uh, do that for a second. If I can just call out the things that scream out, I'm just going to look for the most contrasting areas and draw those in line. And the trick will be, uh, well, it'll be two tricks. One, it'll just be line or it'll be a thick line. So I, and I'm starting with the premise as I look at this lovely little sketch here, or if I look at anything, my eye goes, my artist's eye now, not my structural eye, my eye goes to the area, whoops, yep, to the area of greatest contrast. The darkest dark against the lightest light. So I can just flat out sketch an eye or a couple eyes by getting a simple version of that eyebrow. And any simple uh, mark or sets of marks I can coordinate off a grid is a nice way to work it out. I can see, is it horizontal? Well, in here, it actually gets very close to horizontal. And I could do, use the old Atelier Barg system, chiseled realism is the way I think of it. This is not quite vertical down here. And I'm just going to sketch it out with a beautiful a nuanced line, a chiseled simplification line, even a kind of a messy line. I might have to draw it several times to feel comfortable. Might have to correct. Might want to draw much lighter at first. Ghosting it in. I don't do much of that because it's hard to see on camera before I commit and working that out piece by piece. And if I just were to outline the eyebrow and work out 
the nuanced or better yet when I'm starting out the simplified version of the upper eyelid with the lashes and maybe the dark of the pupil and iris, maybe even the whole dark of the, the ball itself. And let's say the dark of the lower lid, I can get a decent result with practice. And with practice, I'll start to see when it's not so decent and I'll make corrections. It might help to fill it in. And just pure observation is super valuable tool. What am I really seeing there? And when I do that, when I ask that, it's actually combining several questions. What do I see is, you know, what's the shape I see that all those lines create? What's the position of the lines I'm making? That's what that grid was helping me with maybe. What's the proportions of the line? Is this far enough away or should it be closer? And as I add more and more little pieces, maybe I'll draw the um, The crease of the upper lid there, where it meets the underside of that brow. I can start maybe get, getting that correctly, and I don't have a ton of time or probably uh, ego, emotions invested in it. So if it's not so great, I can just do it again. Let's do it a second time. Do it a hundredth time till I get it right. I can do that with construction lines. So when I uh, build up the courage to get this lot, eye in the, uh, laid out, drawn, I don't get it in the wrong place. I have a better chance of getting it in the right place. So, on. so we can just draw it as contour. Sometimes we need to fill it in with its own uh, value to see if it's accurate or not. So I th I'm thinking this needs to arc over here, maybe a little higher than where I made the the um, crook of that happen. And I can make those just observational adjustments. And if the, if the information's clear, it's not in murky shadows, it's not far away, it's not super low resolution. And especially if there's good local color or local value, dark brow, dark lashes, dark pupils, then you get that value change, it's easier to see. Also, if it's in a simple position, it's easier to see. But when it starts moving out of that simple position, mainly straight on, it can get more and more difficult. And we start to notice more and more things that have to be addressed. And that becomes these structural, structural things. And one of the things we'll have to figure out as it moves is, let's see here. Is what's coming forward and what's going back? What's in flat perspective? What's in foreshortened perspective? It can get really complicated. So we want to ease into those kind of big, sophisticated questions that have potential for for huge frustration and seeking answers, and keep it keep it a little lighter. Let's do this. I just grabbed some old photos off of some, not quite so old, but this old vintage photo off um, Wikimedia, uh, Wiki Commons, which has free copyright free stuff. So again, you can see the dark eyebrows, dark makeup. She's in a little more difficult position and I can start working these things out. And I'm gonna draw lighter here as I try and, to fi try and figure it out. And I can do it with light lines. And I'll do a lot of light lines so I don't feel committed. I'll go to where things get pretty close together. The brows come down pretty close and then they arc up beautifully. 
and they also go from thicker to thinner and from more curved to a little boxier and I can kind of work those things out and then if I do do that carefully and this was just kind of uh, kind of careful knocked it out pretty quick so I probably want to take quite a bit more time but if I do that carefully then I can come in and just lay in thicker lines and I can take things that are separate like every lash and group it into some kind of bigger simpler shape for the shaded upper lid and the dark lashes and I can always pull off a couple wispy suggestions of la separate lashes and then when I'm making it thicker I'm either thickening it up because it's a darker local value dark lashes dark brow it's a different value by its very nature or because it's not catching as much light like the underside of the lid here maybe or this down here a little bit the crease Crease of the upper lid, the turn of the upper lid with the lashes down, and I can catch those little subtle areas, the lacrimal lake in there, and so on. And I can even get bold enough to try and grab local color differences because shadow is a dark local or local value differences, because things that are in shadow are darker in their low in their value as opposed to things that are in light and so on. And I can do that strongly, or I can do that more subtly. I can do it with a hard edge. I can do it with a little bit of gradation. And again, you can get a pretty good, pretty good, fairly quickly start to, to establish those, those ideas. And when you see something that's, not quite right when you kind of practice just the observation, you'll more quickly discover it's not quite right. Well, shoot, the way I did that doesn't feel in character with her eye and it's making her a little cross-eyed. So that didn't help. So just pure observation without analysis and just using a trick of line, lots of little lines to find just the right one, thick lines to show a, a deep uh, crevice, or a thick, thick plane, or a local color difference, I can get pretty good results. But eventually, if I want to do more than just observe and just take lots of time maybe to capture, to get it looking like that down here, I probably need some analysis, some strategy, some understanding. So let's look at that for a second. So when we start getting things in more dramatic positions, and also oftentimes with more dramatic light, this is a little more flat lit. It's flat lit like a photographer. It's a, a flash, but it's uh, it's throwing everything that's extremely to the other side into shadow. Basically, most everything else is in light. This is more direct light. Anything that turns down is getting much darker or going into a crevice getting much darker. But both of those inform. And when we start to get into that three quarter view as opposed to what was more or less a um, front view or the first one, the, the uh, sergeant uh, uh, straight on front view, uh, when we start to get into that three quarter of the profile, we'll start to see structure happen. And then we'll start to have a chance to understand more than we did before. And then we can start to create strategies for capturing that new wisdom in our piece. So one of the things we'll notice is that the forehead steps back in. And so whatever is going on with that eye, it's set back in 
like a stair step, forehead, eyeball. And then this seems to drop down pretty straight. Not a lot going on there, so I can't quite understand that. But I do know that the eyeball and all the eye structure, whatever it is, and seemingly with a cheek is stepping back. Although here when she smiled, whoops, that's not what we wanted to do. Here where she smiled, it forced that cheek out. So again, there's some trouble there I got to work out. But I'm just noticing that foreheads are forward. We have to drift back and we're beveling back. Going not straight back, but down and back to get to that eye. And then the cheek does something else I don't quite understand yet. But that gives me some insight. The other thing I notice is when I, let's see here. There we go. When I look at that stepping back idea, Forgive me for fumbling around there. When I look at that stepping back idea, the forehead dumps back to the eye. And that shows off pretty consistently, it seems, because here's the hair of the eyebrow. Here's the hair of the eyebrow, very crudely put in. I notice that I can show that same stepping back without all that rendering of light and shadow, understanding a structure that I don't really understand at this point. But just super simple, if I just draw the eyebrow well forward, to the inner eye. To that inner eye. Let's see here. Now I'm over here. Come on. Here we go. Notice that where the eyebrow sits, right there, I have to step all the way back in here to get to the beginning of the eye. That's not true on the inside of this far eye. <clears throat> eyebrow, here are the eyebrows somewhere in here. It's outside of that eye, but on this near eye, I gotta step back. That might be useful. So I'm going to think about that a little bit more. So this also steps back a little bit, but the inside, again, doesn't help me on that far side. But whether it's inside or out, when I'm looking at a, a, um, the structure of the eye in any position. I want to pay attention to where the inside of the eyebrow is compared to the inside of the eyeballs are. And I can do the same on the outside. And that's going to end up paying me dividends, it looks like.
So when I draw just a really simple eyebrow, just crude, oops, let's do it here, crude understanding of that one. I'm just going to make sure I step back. Like that. And probably the farther I step back, the better. That's going to give me a very crude way to signal to my audience that the eye structure set back in. And even on these contours, we can see that where the eyebrow, forehead, either one or both of those are, there's some kind of stepping back to get to the eye. On the outside of the eyebrow or in the inside of the eyebrow and sometimes both. But that's going to help positioning that underneath. Because if I put it in the wrong position, let's see here. it's going to look structurally flat. Now, I haven't really drawn structure yet. I haven't thought of bald boxes and tubes. I haven't thought of sculpting. I am thinking of trying to get that thing to move over. Sculpting. But notice each of these simple front views, I can just pay attention to a basic shape and position for the eyebrows, proportional positioning to the eyelid, hair of the eyelid, iris pupil, in here, all those things. And I can do get a pretty good job just observing it, sketching it out, and then I can apply a local value to those separated out silhouetted shapes. But if I get in more extreme positions, I need to pay attention to that forehead in some way or another pushing out before it comes back to the nose. And wherever that forehead is, I want to see where exactly the eyebrow, however I draw it, sits. And I want to step back in to get the – and even if I'm doing it really crudely, that step does a lot of work for me. I don't have any constructed planes or any of that kind of stuff. And in fact, as I realize that that's setting back, I start to notice an interesting thing with my favorite artists or my lovely reference. Oftentimes the eyeball as it sits in that eye socket is a little darker. And of course, the local color of lashes and pupil and iris and brow and maybe even strong shadow shapes, but we'll leave those things out. But that whole area kind of gets pegged a little darker. Gets darker because it catches light or shadow. It doesn't catch as much light as it should. It catches shadow. It gets darker because there's some structure there we got to figure out that we don't understand yet. But if I do 
one thing, it's usually enough. I'll draw this closest eye here. I just want to step back before I get that eye, however I'm going to draw it. Eyeball, eyelid, local value, spotting the shapes as a design problem, whatever I'm doing. If I can get that set back in, it does a lot. Does a lot. Just that much. And I'll notice even in cartoons where I'll get a little character And oftentimes, as crude and stylized as it is, they'll do the same thing. They'll step back before they put that eyeball there. And if I don't do that, it's going to look very funny. It's going to look flat. So I want to watch for that. And every once in a while, you'll see that in, in uh, with a person where it sets back. Or it can be an angle that shows it. Sometimes it will do that every once in a while. But... I'm going to look for this. And then if I were to push that area under the eyebrow before the cheek, give or take, adding or not adding the local value differences, that actually helps too if I'm going to use tone. And so let's look back at our first one here. And you'll notice that Sargent, when he sketched this lovely little painting, he made a point of knocking down the whole eye socket. And he did that for two reasons. And all of these, well, not all ever, but most of these realist structural artists will do the same thing. And whatever else he does, He will have drawn or painted the local value differences. He may have drawn or painted the light and shadow differences. Might have done both. But by knocking that down a little darker, it pushes it back into the shadows. This is setting back in, and it's all actually darker, and we don't notice it. Because we have the beautiful highlight on the eyeball, the lower lid catching light, the whites of the eye as opposed to the tan of the flesh. These are all knocked down. And so a painter, structural painter, will quite often, more often than not, knock that all down and then come in and push the shadow shapes if he sees them. The local value changes as he sees them. And they can be dramatically different or subtly different. <clears throat> and then he'll come back afterwards, if he's going to at all. And catch 
the light, the high light, the life light, as they call it, or upward facing planes that catch uh, lighter values subtly or dramatically, or the whole structure of the eyeball, if we happen to see that. And sometimes we won't, especially if it's a straight on view. Or sometimes we're not quite sure because it's so confusing between light and shadow and value changes. But other times we'll beautifully see the ball pushing out. Can you see how the lids and the orbicular area are gradating over the whole ball? It gradates top to bottom, left to right. Eventually we want to know that. We don't always need it. Sometimes we can just drop that eye area back behind, have it step back be, uh, from the hair of the eyebrow. Sometimes it'll drop into shadow or a darker range of values. See the darker range of values compared to the forehead. And then they come back in and catch the hot spot of the lower lid, the hot spot in the eye, and so on. Other times it all just kind of sets in there. And all you have to do is put in the dark pupils. And if you want a uh, a light uh, highlight in there. But you can see even here, it's knocking the whole thing down. Knocks it down to, sets it, to set it back, but also knocks it down so that I have a value range to bring those highlights out. I can't do a highlight. I just did a highlight here. I can't do that. But by do knocking it down in local color for the pupil, knocking the whole socket down, I can separate the hot spot of the pupil or the lighter, relatively lighter area of the upper lid or the relatively light spot of the lower lid catching shelving out. And notice it sets up the value range to allow me to render. I can push it down darker into those deeper crevices in here or I can push it lighter to pop it. So that value range becomes important. So if I'm doing a little bit of, of uh, rendering or a lot of rendering with value, I can chase after the shadow shapes as I've seen them, but I can also just knock that whole eye socket down and then render it back up. And Sargent does both of those. He'll knock the eye socket way down Notice how dark it is. It sets it back. There's that step back from the forehead. In this case, hides almost everything from catching light except a little flick on the upper lid and lower lid, and even less so on here. Coming out and catching a little bit of life as it, as it steps back out. So, but just the step back in shadow or step back in a little bit of half tone does wonders. You can see this is nicely lit, but he knocked the whole thing down and then he pushed the shadow side even darker and then he lifted the light side up a little bit, but not as much as he did the forehead, stepping forward, stepping back. And then he's catching a little lighter yet to render a bit, but it's a real simple process. And you can see how any of these things can be broken down into an even simpler set of solutions, just lines, marks in position and proportion, just local colors, uh, local values in there. But it can be a little bit more clever than that. We can make sure we step back before we have that that lid in relationship and the eyeball under it in relationship to the hair of the eyebrow, just stepping back. And maybe if we're clever and planning to do some rendering, oops, dusting back. Okay, so we're gonna stop there for now. That's kind of the setup. 
So notice any of these things, and this is the most complicated part of the whole body, anything here, anything out there, there's always a way of making it simpler than it is, than it appears to be. Having a process that gives you a quite good or good enough results compared to the massive amount of information that we might otherwise be stuck with, frustrated, dead stop because we don't know how to get to the next step. Don't even know if there is a next step. We don't, we know it's wrong. We don't know what it's wrong. So there's ways of always simplifying it down. And then we can slowly layer on the information and eventually come at it in a very sophisticated way if we want, but we never have to. And I almost never do. I'll start really simple and I'll build on top of that. Simple shape design, simple value choices, simple positions, eyebrow here, stepping back to the eye here. Really simple ideas, simple ball in a hole eventually, simple box logic eventually. We'll talk about all those things, but just sussing it out so that at each stage with some practice, and sometimes it takes quite a bit of practice, we can get a quite good solution quite quickly, quite simply. And that's what I want. I want at each stage of my drawing process that if I had to stop there, it's somewhat satisfying. Now, if I just rush, rush it and do it quick, it probably won't be satisfying. It might get a little bit of the point across, but it won't really be satisfying. So I want to slow down enough. Doesn't have to be radically slow, but slow down enough that it looks pretty good. It looks it looks it looks like it rings true. It's in the ballpark. And if I had more times, I would make it a little more and even a lot more refined. But the essential qualities are there right away. So that's where most of the work goes in for me. Am I starting it in a simple enough manner? And am I putting in not a ton of time because I don't want to commit to a rendering, but am I putting in enough observation and and patience that I'm getting a simple but clear, simple yet characteristic, something that rings true right away. If not, I'll stay with that a little longer or try again, when try again, 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 until I get a better solution. And then I'll build more complexity, more sophistication uh, on top of that, more techniques, shift to other mediums with the same process. It opens things up for us. Okay, so we'll stop there. I hope that is useful.